It was quite a number of years ago that a, a pastor I know just said goodbye to his wife on what, if I remember correctly, was an ordinary Saturday morning. They lived in a block of flats, and he said goodbye to her. She was just going to run some errands. And a couple of minutes later, he heard this tremendous crash out in the street in front of their block of flats, and he raced to the window, and as he looked down into the street, horror of horrors, it was his wife's car absolutely smashed and mangled, and clearly the vehicle that had hit her had been coming at an incredible speed just as she turned out of their block of flats. And I remember hearing of how he ran down the stairs as fast as he could, and he, he burst out the doors of the flat out into the street, and he managed to get into that mangled wreck. And I remember that what I heard about has always stuck with me all these years. As he was in that wreck, and as his wife was breathing her last breaths, he gently took her hand, and he recited to her the words of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And somewhere in between the quivering words of Psalm 23, this pastor friend of mine's dear wife, his precious wife, went home to be with her Lord. And he's had to journey over these past two decades and come to experience what it means to walk with the shepherd even in some of the most difficult places. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said that Psalm 23 has been a dying pillow to thousands of God's saints down through the ages. And as I've thought about this message and as I've thought about some of you and what you're going through, as I look at my own life, my prayer has been that Psalm 23 would be a dying pillow to each of us, whether now in whatever we're facing or maybe even 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now when we find ourselves in a similar place. And so our text this morning is Psalm 23, verse 4. I encourage you to have the scriptures open in front of you so you can see the context. And we're just going to camp, camp on this verse, and we're going to mine it for the riches that God wants us to discover. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I think the danger for many of us as sheep this morning is that we would be willing to walk with the shepherd all the way to the green pastures. We'd be willing to walk with the shepherd past the quiet waters, but somehow when the shepherd brings us to the brink of the valley of the shadow of death, it's there that we abandon him. It's there that we say, Lord, how is it possible that you could have brought me to this place? And we shrink back. We, we, we want to run the other way because we, we, we want to be in green pastures and quiet waters, but we cannot fathom why the shepherd would lead us to a valley such as this. And the point is that we don't know how to trust the shepherd at the very point that trust is actually needed. You see, if a shepherd wants to lead his sheep up onto the mountaintops of summer grazing, there's no other way to get them there other than through the deep, dark valleys because it's going somewhere to the mountaintops. And so the first question I have of our text, <clears throat> excuse me, is what is the valley of the shadow of death? What is this valley? The Hebrew word for valley is the word gorge. And if you've ever been to the Middle East, parts of Israel and surrounds, you would know that there are many, many gorges uh, there's even one down on the Jerusalem to Jericho Road. And Kenneth Bailey is a New Testament scholar. He's an expert on Middle Eastern culture. If you can read any of his books on the parables, he's written a book on all the shepherding passages in the Bible. Uh, just a, a, a real expert in these areas. Tells of one such gorge just outside of the city of Petra. And he had visited there just a couple of months after this horrific flash flood had come down this gorge. He describes how a wall of water 
solid water almost had come down this gorge and had taken the lives of something like 50 tourists. The personnel who worked at the site pointed out to him a particular spot where two women had been walking a little bit in front of the rest of their tour party and they'd heard just screams coming from behind them and somehow they had the sense to, to jump up into these two narrow side crevices and in those moments, boulders just came crashing through and the mangled bodies of all the other travelers. So that's the danger of these dark valleys. These water-cut gorges are called in Arabic wadis, and maybe you've heard of the word wadi, W-A-D-I. They're a threatening place. Wild predators, bandits, and thieves can be lurking there in the shadows. There are pitfalls on this side and there are precipices on that side. There are crevices, there are crags, there's, there's damp, there's cold. There's this potential of, of flash floods. And for those of us who, who are sheep, we look around and we say, this, this, is a, this is a road I've never passed before. This is unfamiliar territory. There's no book that's written about how to handle suffering, what to do when there's sudden loss, when there's crisis in our lives, when there's trauma and tragedy that just strikes us. We don't know what to do. And so wherever we turn, there's fear in every shadow. And as we look out, we, we can't even see what's ahead. It's, it's hazy. The visibility is poor. And so we have to rely on other senses to be able to perceive the closeness of our shepherd. The word in the Hebrew for shadow of death is actually one word. It's a compound word which you could translate death shadow. This is a word that's used 18 times in the Old Testament, probably about 10 times in the book of Job. 10 times this word creeps up on Job and, 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 and scares him and makes him fearful. But yet God is with Job. It carries the idea of death that is just lurking nearby, death that is stalking us. And yet at the same time, it's also a word that doesn't just point to death, but any dark tragedy, any deep trial, any depression that is crushing us, any situation, maybe in our marriage or in our family, and we just feel the darkness. But the ultimate reality is death. And death, the shadow of death, casts its evil shadow over all of our lives. Death exposes what we truly believe. That's the thing that scares me. Justin, what kind of theology of suffering do you have? Because has that really been tested? And for each of us, when we're in the great times of good pastures and, and quiet waters, it's there that we build our theology, but it's, it's in the valley. It's in the valley that our true colors come out because it's in deep waters that our true colors are washed out and we see what we really believe. And I want you to see in our text that verse 3 of Psalm 23, which says, He guides me in paths of righteousness, lays the foundation for verse 4. So verse 3, paths of righteousness comes before verse 4. That means that even in this difficult valley, God is still leading us. He is still taking us on to good things, to righteousness. Even the evil in our lives, even the fallenness of the world, God is transforming. Even this is part of this path to the way of righteousness. But I know it doesn't feel like that. And so as we look out, we see dangers all around us. And Satan will come and he'll convince us that we're in this valley because it's just random. He'll convince us that we're in this valley because maybe we've done something wrong. Satan will come and he will heighten our senses and he'll make the, the gloomy depths even deeper than they are. He will, he will boost our senses so that, that, that our fear is just out of all proportion. And he'll say, you see, you've got to this valley because the shepherds abandoned you. You said God was loving. You trusted him. You trusted him in vain. And here you are in this valley. And Satan will even magnify the shadows to such proportions that you and I forget that behind every shadow, there has to be a light. There has to be a light behind every shadow. And so very simply this morning, all I want us to look at in our passage is three lights of hope in this valley. And I'm hoping that God by His Spirit will deeply encourage you. I see three lights of hope in the midst of our text. And if you're here this morning and you can say, the Lord is my shepherd, then these three lights will be able to comfort you. They will be able to protect you from being afraid of evil. So let's jump in and have a look. Number one, there's the light at the end of the valley. The light at the end of the valley. 
You might say, Justin, where do you get that from in our text? Well, look at our text. It says, even though I walk through, I walk through the valley of the shadow of, the, of death. What does that mean? It means the valley of the shadow of death isn't the destination. This isn't the final resting place. This is a thoroughfare. We are walking through. This is not the end. This is not where we sit down and, and die, so to speak. This is where we are moved onto summer grazing. The shepherd is leading us intentionally somewhere. And the good shepherd knows that there's no other way to the top of the mountain but through this valley. And we've seen those prosperity preachers across our city and in our nation who are offering people false hope and false promises, and they are saying, no, if, if you just have enough faith, you won't go through the valley. If you could just believe enough, you know, the shepherd is good. He would never take you there, but I want to say, brothers and sisters, on the authority of the Word of God, and not just this text, but the whole tenor of Scripture, that the cross precedes the crown. If the good shepherd himself couldn't make it to the top, couldn't be crowned without a road of suffering, that I don't think it's possible for you and I to avoid this. Because the shepherd is leading us somewhere, but he often does not lead us around it. He leads us through it. He leads us through it. And, and if you're here this morning and you're a sheep who's caught in this valley, then I want to say to you, I understand as your pastor and as someone who journeys with people, I understand even my own heart of what it feels like to be afraid to look out at evil and to wonder what, 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 what is this madness called evil? Why, why does God allow it? And I know it feels like you'll never get through this. I know it feels like this is your final resting place. I know as you look at these walls, they, they seem imposing, that they're crashing down on you, that you're afraid every turn. You just see fear and you think, is that the sound of water rushing? Is that wrath that's about to come upon me? But I wanna encourage you, don't stay here. Don't allow this place to be your identity. Don't shake someone's hand and the first thing you do is say, I'm a widow or a widower or I'm a parent of a deceased child. Because often we, we stay here and, and our grief and our pain begins to shape us. It becomes our identity and we, we think, how will I ever get past this? And I wanna remind you in Christ that the shepherd has been leading you before this point and he will lead you on after this point but here we find ourselves in this parenthesis called the valley of the shadow of death. And some of us can't move past this place because fear is holding us hostage. But don't dwell here. Don't stay stuck here. By God's grace, walk on, move on. The shepherd is leading you through. And I say to you on the authority of the scripture that not even the grave itself for a child of God is a final resting place. This grave is not the end. The grave is not. Spurgeon said, Jesus has transformed death from a dreary cavern into a passage leading to glory. There's a light at the end of the valley and it is called through. It is called through. And David, we read, he says he is walking. He's walking. He has to consider each step carefully. God's not giving him enough grace for five steps from now, just one step at a time because the risk in the valley is that if you don't keep walking, if you're not circumspect and careful about the steps you're taking, the risk is great that in this valley you could fall back, that you could slip, that you could abandon the faith. And so keep walking, even as God keeps you persevering. Well, that's number one, the light at the end of the valley. But there's a second hope, and that's the light behind the valley. The light behind the valley. Our text says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, the shadow of death. Harold Kushner is a Jewish rabbi and he's written a book on Psalm 23. And he says, human beings are the only creatures who know throughout their lives that they are fated to die. And that knowledge can cast a shadow over even the sunniest of our days. And when you think about the reality of that, which we don't often face, I mean, secular hedonists, what do they do? They say, yeah, okay, I know we're gonna die. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die, and they just live it up. And then I suppose the more philosophical amongst us who face the reality of death, if we really faced it, we'd be crushed. We'd be like Ecclesiastes saying, actually, death casts a shadow, which means what is the point of these things if they all be taken from us? 
And so there is this reality, this shadow, this eerie shadow is over all of the land, over all of our lives. But I want you to know the truth that behind every shadow, there is a light. As fearful as the shadow of death is, it is still only a shadow. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, a shadow of a dog can't bite you. A shadow of a dog can't bite you. Now, I know that shadow is looking very intimidating. It's going psycho. And yes, of course, if there's a shadow of a dog, it means the dog is pretty much nearby. But he says the shadow of a dog can't bite you. And in Christ, we recognize that behind this eclipse that death is casting over our lives, behind that eclipse is shining the sun of righteousness. He's standing there blazing in all of his glory. And if you are in Christ, death has been disarmed. It has been defanged. It has been declawed. Death doesn't have the final word because nothing can separate those who love Christ from his love. And the shepherd has gone through this valley before us. He's burst through the other side. He's stood there and he's taken the full fury of God's wrath upon himself as this torrent of watery wrath came down. He averted it. He took it in himself and he protected us. He was our substitute so that you and I, like the apostle Paul, can say, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where a death is your victory. Where a death is your sting. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the logical question is, do you know the shepherd? Do you really know him? If you're not sure this morning, then I encourage you to come to the front afterwards or find somebody who, who does that you can ask to help you, your community group leader. You wanna be sure that you know Christ because you wanna be sure that you have hope beyond death. Cling to Jesus, cling to Jesus. So there's the light at the end of the valley. There's the light behind the valley. And then thirdly, there's the light within the valley. The light within the valley. Our text says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Jesus, we know from the New Testament, is the light of the world. And I think this text points most supremely to him. And David says, the light of the world is with me. Here in my valley of aloneness, the light of the world is with me. Albert Barnes is an old commentator, and he just puts this so profoundly and beautifully. Listen to what he says. The dying man seems to go into the dark valley alone. His friends accompany him as far as they can, and then they must give him the parting hand. They cheer him with their voice until he becomes deaf to all sounds. They cheer him with their looks until his eye becomes dim. They cheer him with a fond embrace until he becomes insensible to every expression of earthly affection. And then he seems to be alone. But the dying believer is not alone. His Savior God is with him in that valley and will never leave him. Upon his arm he can lean. And by his presence, he will be comforted until he emerges from the gloom into the bright world beyond. Friends, do you believe that? That there is a place that you will go that no other family member or friend will ever be able to enter into. And maybe it's something short of death, some other trial where you just feel nobody understands. But maybe it's death itself, that you will have this protracted period where you'll just feel alone. But I want you to know that you are not alone. You are not alone. And you will not survive here with a second-hand or a third-hand experience of Christ. You have to have a first-hand experience. I wonder if you've noticed this in the psalm. There is a radical, radical shift in verse 4. Up until verse 4, David has been referring to God in the third person. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me. He leads me. He guides me. He, 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 and he's speaking about God. This is truth about God, but look what happens. Things are so dire, so scary in verse four that he can no longer talk about God. He has to talk to God, and he switches, and he says, you are with me, your rod, your staff, you anoint, you prepare. It's you, 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 and you will not survive in this valley on a second-hand, third-hand experience of God. You need to take what you've learned in the green pastures and quiet waters and apply it here. The difference between talking about God 
and experiencing God has been said to be the difference between reading the menu and enjoying the dinner. Just reading the menu and enjoying the dinner. And some of us know so much about God and we need to say, Lord, won't you apply these truths so that we can experience you in the valley? God's omnipresence in the valley is a wonderful doctrine to believe, but it's an even greater doctrine to experience. To say, Lord, your omnipresence must hug me. It must surround me. It must embrace me, Lord. I want to know your presence in my time of deepest need. I found this old commentary from John Stevenson. I think he wrote it like in the 1660s. And that's what's great about Google Books. They scan in these old books and they're treasure troves. And this is what he wrote. He said, the valley may be deep and it may be dark. It may be reported to abound with unnumbered dangers. Yet the believer does not say, I will feel no evil. The believer says, I will fear no evil. He knows that trials await him. He never deludes himself with the idea that there are no difficulties and no terrors in the valley. He's fully aware that sorrows and pains, shrinkings and agonies, assaults and temptations may befall him. But he exclaims, while I feel them, I will not fear them. You see, it's been said that peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of God in the midst of trouble. Peace is not the absence of trouble, it's the presence of God right there in the very middle midst of our trouble. And so as we tie these strands together from Psalm 23 and verse 4, I have a last question to ask. How does the shepherd enable his sheep to experience his presence? If, he, if our senses are dulled and we can't, it doesn't feel as tangible to us as maybe in the good times, how does the shepherd enable us to experience him, to know that he is really with us? If, if kind of our eyes are dimmed and we need to, to look with the eye of faith, behold him by faith and not by sight. Well, David speaks of two things here. He says in our text, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And here's a picture of what the rod and staff looks like. That rod is that short, heavy, club-like device, and then the staff is longer and thinner with the crook at one end. And because the light is dim in the valley, we have to learn to trust other senses. And the shepherd comes to us. The extension of his hand, of his touch, comes to us through the rod and the staff. So let's look, first of all, at the rod and what it's a picture of. The shepherd's rod, as you saw, was a kind of a knop kiri. It was made out of a young tree sapling, just where the trunk joins onto the roots, and it was rounded into this devastating weapon. And that's what a rod is. It's primarily an offensive weapon. And it became an extension of the shepherd's arm, and he could throw that thing with incredible force and accuracy. It was primarily an offensive weapon against enemies. And sheep need not fear. Just think of the comfort they would draw seeing this rod knowing that the shepherd always carried this rod. It's a picture of authority and power. In fact, the word rod is translated in the rest of the book of Psalms as scepter, which is a picture of royal authority and power. So he has this power to kind of clap the enemies, whether those be bears like David did. He said he killed a bear and a lion, uh, whether it was thieves and predators, whatever. And so I believe that it's most fitting to say that the rod is a picture of God's word. Why? Because God's word is powerful. It is authoritative. It is active. It is that living uh, two-edged sword. It's an extension of the shepherd's arm. So just like when God thinks something, he speaks it and it becomes a reality. The, the word of God is an extension of God's mind and his will. It's his purposes, his heart. So if you want to know what God is like, what God uh, feels, what God is thinking, what God is planning, we read his word. And when the sheep no longer trust that authoritative word, there is no comfort. And when you stop reading God's word, when the church gives up the authority of the word of God, when preachers stand in pulpits and barely ever open the word of God, the, the authoritative word of God is gone. And we look no different from the world. We're a sitting duck. Satan can go on holiday. We're no threat to the kingdom. No threat at all. And when a church abandons the Bible, the church becomes lifeless and weak and we, we've lost our voice and we just surrender to the, to the enemy. But this rod could also be thrown near an erring sheep. 
And so this rod, the word of God, is also a picture of discipline. If a sheep was about to wander off a precipice, the, the shepherd could throw that rod and, and, and startle it back to the flock. If it was about to step onto a snake's lair, he could startle it. And so the word of God disciplines us. It startles us out of our sin. And we can all think of times where a sermon has pierced us, where we've been reading and God has just floored us. Because he knows if we won't be done with poisonous things, if we won't keep wandering off, sometimes he has to startle us. And so just picture the comfort of a sheep walking next to a shepherd who's wielding a rod. It's for our good, because I can wonder, thank you, Lord, that you have kept me from falling. And Lord, thank you that you are against my enemies. As we were singing earlier, God is the God of angel armies. Nothing can stand against us. The Apostle Paul says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? And it's here in the valley that we must hope in God's word. It's here that we've got to saturate our souls. If you haven't had a habit of memorizing God's word, what are you gonna do when you get there? When your eyes are failing, when you may not even have the strength to open the physical word of God, do you know God's word? Is it in your soul? Because if you haven't been memorizing it in the good times, will you be comforted in the bad times? We have to face that reality. It's a challenging reality. Your rod comforts me, but so does God's staff. And that staff we saw in that picture is the most recognizable emblem of any shepherd. And it's a picture of intimacy, the shepherd using that staff to just draw sheep together in intimacy. There's so many other uh, examples of, of what the rod and staff refer to, and I've tried to just limit myself. But the main function is to assure the, the sheep that the shepherd is near. And Philip Keller, who wrote that best-selling book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, writes this. He says, sometimes I've been fascinated to see how a shepherd will actually hold his staff against the side of some sheep that is a special favorite, simply so that they are in touch. They will walk along this way almost as though they were hand in hand. The sheep obviously enjoys the special attention from the shepherd and revels in the close personal intimate contact between them. To be treated in this special way by the shepherd is to know comfort in a deep dimension. It is a delightful and moving picture. And so I think it's fitting to think of the staff as a picture of the beautiful Holy Spirit. Maybe sometimes the Holy Spirit is the forgotten member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit that, that calls us to Christ, the Holy Spirit that assures us of our faith so that we know that we know that we know, the Holy Spirit who is the counselor, who convicts us. And his main role is to do what? It is to magnify Christ. It is to make Christ's presence so tangible to us, to give us a peace that transcends all understanding so that if we stand at somebody's bedside, we say, how is it that God can give them this comfort? Maybe not even a level of comfort that goes to the family members, but to the individual. I remember standing at the bedside of a man by the name of Bill on a Sunday afternoon, and I knew it was probably three, four hours before he'd be gone and holding his hand and reciting Psalm 23, and then to have his family join and to look into their faces, but to recognize that God had given Bill a deep peace, the ministry of the Spirit, even in these moments, as he stared into eternity. Both rod and the staff, the Word and the Spirit, are the two means that God uses to make Christ real to us. God is not always immediate be present to our senses. He comes through the ministry of the Word and the Spirit. And so we ought to pray, oh Holy Spirit, fill me afresh. Fill me with your presence. Holy Spirit, fill me with your truth. Oh Holy Spirit, come and make the Word of God alive to me. Reveal Christ to me. Oh sheep of God, won't you draw comfort again today in whatever you're facing from the Word of God and the Spirit? Because I believe what you need most in the valley is not answers, but comfort. That's what somebody who's journeying with me said to me last year, and it was a profound turning point. Justin, you're always overanalyzing, you're always thinking, you always want answers, you're always wanting to figure out what's happening here, what's the next bend, what's this, what does this mean, what is this scenario? He said, you know what you need? You need to know God's comfort. And yes, if God answers some of those questions, maybe that's a bonus, but actually, Answers to our wise don't really 
help our souls. If we were to get answers to all our questions, maybe we'd be more baffled because we're dealing with a, a God of mystery, a God of providence. What you need is consolation, not explanation. You need God to come and minister deeply to your soul in the valley. And so I ask again, do you know Christ? If you don't know him this morning, if you're not sure if you know him, what will you do about that? Because what are you gonna cling to? What are you gonna hope in when you get to this valley of the shadow of death? What are you gonna, gonna, gonna look to for substance and say, this will, will keep me going, this will give me hope? If you don't know Christ, what will that substance be? So I'd like to close with the words of a sermon from J.C. Ryle. They were encouraging and challenging to me. And I trust that, one, if you don't know Christ, that these words would drive you to Christ. And if you do know Christ, that these words would remind you of the resources you have in Him. So let me read part of this sermon. Chemistry never silenced a guilty conscience. Mathematics never healed a broken heart. All the sciences in the world never smoothed down a dying pillow. They can never give the believer wings and enable him to soar towards heaven. But what about the good things of the world? The good things of the world cannot comfort a man when he draws near death. All the gold will not provide light for the valley. Money can buy the best medical advice, but money cannot buy peace for the conscience. What about relatives and loved friends? They cannot comfort a man when he draws near death. They may minister affectionately to his bodily wants. They may watch by his bedside tenderly and anticipate his every wish. They may smooth down his dying pillow and support his sinking frame in their arms. But they cannot minister to a mind diseased. They cannot stop the achings of a troubled heart. They cannot screen an uneasy conscience from the eye of God. And what about the pleasures of the world? They cannot comfort a man when he draws near death. The brilliant ballroom, the merry dance, the midnight revel. To be invited to feasts and regattas and fancy fairs gives him no ease. He cannot hide himself that these are hollow, empty, powerless things. They are out of harmony with his condition. They cannot stop one gap in his heart when the enemy is coming in like a flood. They cannot make him calm in the prospect of meeting a holy God. And what about books and newspapers? They cannot comfort a man when he draws near to death. The most able article in the Times will fail to interest him. The last new novel will lie unopened and unheeded. Their time will be past. Their vocation will be gone. Whatever they may be in health, they're useless in the hour of death. There is but one fountain of comfort for a man drawing near to his end, and that is the Bible. Chapters out of the Bible texts out of the Bible, statements of truth taken out of the Bible, books containing matter drawn from the Bible. These are a man's only chance of comfort when he comes to die. I do not at all say that the Bible will do good to a dying man if he has not valued it before. But I do say positively that no dying man will ever get real comfort except from the contents of the Word of God. All comfort from any other source is a house built upon sand. Friend, won't you make Christ your dying pillow of comfort this day and echo these words from the Bible that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let's pray together. Our Holy Spirit, we need you more than we recognize. We need you to come and open the word of God to us. Your word is truth. Holy Spirit, you will never speak what is contrary to the word of God. There is a great unity. I pray for your ministry in our lives, Lord, that whatever we are facing now, that you would just come and still and quieten our hearts. Not because the storm isn't still raging, not because the evil isn't still biting, not because the, the shadow is, is, is still casting its, its gloomy light, but that you come and comfort us because we are part of a different reality, a reality that is more real than the reality that we think is reality. That Lord, right now in these moments, right now in the valley of the shadow of death, whether it be our marriage that's in trouble, whether it be our family, whether it be our children, whether it be a loved one with a terminal illness, 
Lord, whether it be a a tumor, whether it be sickness, whether it be impending doom, whether it be unemployment, whether it be threats of crime, Lord, whatever it may be, Lord, thank you that you are with us, that you haven't promised to always take us around, but you have promised to take us through. And Lord, that even the greatest threat, death itself, is nothing. Lord, we know that to us, we are fearful. You've made us sheep-like creatures. We're skittish, we're timid. You know that we are but dust. Lord, you know that we're frail, that we're mortal. Lord, you even know that we fear the moment of dying. But I pray that you'd give us a courage that wouldn't fear death itself, that above and beyond that we might see you, our shepherd, with such a blazing clarity because you've come and you've touched us with your staff and with your rod, that we would know that you love us with an undying love. Thank you, our good shepherd, for what you're doing in our lives. I pray that you would minister these truths to us, Lord, even if we don't need them today. May this psalm ring in our ears, even on that last day, when our breath is failing, Lord, as you come and hold our feeble hand. Lord, won't Psalm 23 come and be what it has always been to so many who've gone this way before? Work your glory in us, Lord, so that our lives can be a testament to others who do not know you of what deep comfort and hope can look like. Lord, we pray that we as believers would not be like the rest of the world who grieve because they have no hope. Remind us that we do not grieve like the rest of the world because we do have hope. And may that hope be the means to encourage people that we'll meet tomorrow who are deeply broken, deeply grieving, and deeply hurting. Oh, good shepherd, come and work your purposes in us, we pray. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.